Hey. Right, okay, OpenGL Basics for OS X. Um, my name's Andrew Bennett, and I'll be presenting this. I'm from the University of Tasmania. Um, I study computing. I'm still undergrad, although I've been doing OpenGL sort of things, knowledges, for quite a while. Um, hello. Uh, I'm in a group of people that's called the Mac Lab. We're about half of the people here. There's quite a few of us, but you'll see us around. There's a lot of UTAS people. Uh, you should encourage other people from your unis to come to these things and um, even give talks yourselves. Okay, uh, more about me. That's not me. No, this is that. I I'm quite tired and I haven't actually read most of my slides. I can't remember most of them. And I have a whole lot of cats, but I may have some in there. Um, so, yeah, if I am talking too quickly or you can't understand me or you have any questions throughout the entire thing, just put up your hand and I'll try and get to you and answer your questions if I can. Okay, so a brief and heavily biased summary, history, and or introduction to computer graphics. Okay, um, right, let's go. Oh, yes, I apologise, I kind of had to play with Keynote throughout all of this. and I may kill you. Okay, oh, and also introducing this thing called super maths, um, where it's kind of like real maths, although I'm fuzzing over it, so it may not be technically correct the entire time. Although we'll just call it super maths. Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce some uh, concepts that are key to graphics and all that sort of thing. Um, one of these things is vectors, and which is basically a number in a higher dimension. So instead of just thinking of a number, a linear number in one direction, a vector is kind of like a number in two directions. So you can think of it as both a distance and an angle, or maybe um, just two coordinates on a grid, or maybe even in higher dimensions you could have three or n coordinates. Okay, so yeah, a vector equals a coordinate. It's a pretty similar concept. Um, if you're actually a mathematician and you weren't talking super maths, then you may say this slightly differently, but uh, vector equals coordinate. Okay, so the most basic uh, vector is probably a 2D vector, which is just like a point on a grid paper, uh, like we've got there. And so uh, you can think of a vector as an arrow or a direction. And so in this instance, we've got this arrow here going to that point, which is actually the vector. And then that vector has two components, which is the x and the y component, which together make up that vector. So each one of these components, the red and the green, are scalar, which is an equivalent of a one-dimensional vector. And then together they make up the two-dimensional vector. Okay, and that's represented like this. Uh, four, five would mean that it's four one way and then five the other way. There's a million different ways to represent that depending on how super maths you want to be. Okay, so put on your 3D glasses. God knows where I've found that. Okay, 3D vectors. It's the same idea, except if you can imagine coming out of the um, graph paper, you've got your same X and Y coordinates, and then you've got another one which comes out which is your Z coordinate, and that gives you that third dimension and depth. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, demonstrate how to use these sort of three-dimensional coordinates uh, inside your computer and then represent objects with them and that sort of thing. Okay, so once again, you've got your three components and then this time you've got the Z as well. Okay, vector transformations. Uh, all of these concepts that I'm introducing at the moment aren't specifically OpenGL, but they kind of, they're kind of this massive umbrella over OpenGL, and they're the sort of concepts you need to understand in order to use OpenGL and expand upon it. Okay, so the first transformation we're going to talk about is uh, move, which basically is just uh, translation or moving something around. And so this is an operation you can do on vectors, which is just like adding two things together. So the equivalent for numbers is 4 plus 3 equals 7. So here we're translating something uh, 4 minus 1, which is the equivalent of like plus 4. And so that's the sort of thing you'd see. That's called translation. The next thing is called scale, uh, which is basically change the size of something. So scaling by 0.5 would mean that you scale it down and it's half as big as it was previously. And then another idea is rotation, 
And so in this instance, you'd give it an angle, and then you'd say rotate, and it rotates. And so basically, for all of these things are things you can do to vectors. As I was saying before, a vector can be thought of either as coordinates or as a direction and an angle. And so in this instance, you're actually keeping the, uh, sorry, a distance and an angle. So in this instance, you're keeping the distances all the same, and you're just changing the angle. Now, I apologize if some of you guys are familiar with OpenGL and seen all this stuff before. It's quite basic at the moment. If you want more complicated stuff, there's a few more OpenGL talks as well. I'm giving a later one on optimization, which is quite complex. OK, so rotation in 3D. Put on your 3D glasses again. OK, uh, rotation in 3D is a bit complex, a bit hard to kind of uh, demonstrate, especially on a 2D plane like this. But if any of you are familiar with the uh, gyroscope, basically, you, <laughs> Josh has got his 3D glasses on. Um, basically, you have any uh, axis, which is basically just a line in three-dimensional space, and then you can specify an angle around this axis, and then just like the rotor here, uh, you can rotate that rotor around that axis. And then that's how you'd specify a rotation in three dimensions. Unless you want to get into quaternions and all that sort of complicated stuff, but we're not going to cover any of that in this lecture. Okay. So now I've talked about all these vector operations and all this abstract stuff, what you really want to be able to do is represent an object like me or you or the chair or the lanyard in three dimensions. Okay. So there are several different ways to do this. In fact, there are probably hundreds of ways to do this. And there are different approaches for different, uh, basically, different things you want to do. Um, there are absolutely precise solutions where you can have an object exactly represented in three dimensions. Um, and uh, pretty much all of the time, this is using mathematical formula. So, for example, a sphere, you want all points on the object to be exactly the same distance from the center. Um, Basic objects can be drawn quickly and efficiently with little memory overhead um, because you've just got a function for the sphere. There's like no memory used. You're using like, I don't know, a couple of operations and that's it. Um, and so that's quite quick. It's efficient, although it's a really simple object. A sphere is just like a circle in 3D. And so while it's quite easy and it's straightforward and it's efficient, you can't necessarily represent that many things just purely with a sphere. And so when you want to create more complicated objects, you start looking at functions in higher dimensions and you start looking at really complicated maths and programs and then your efficiency drops off straight away. And so it's quite often taxing for the programmer because they have to come up with all these complicated polynomials and whatnot. And it's also complicated for an artist because generally artists aren't mathematicians, although I'm an exception. Okay, so this is an example of some code for a simple sphere. It's kind of pseudo code. Um, it's not really a real language. I just kind of started off with real languages and messed around. But basically, this is a sort of code you'd be looking at just to draw something as simple as a sphere. And so really, this is quite a simple um, function, or two functions even. And um, this sort of thing would be good for a sphere, although one, when you start to get up to things of higher dimensions or you start to make composite objects with things like Bezier patches and other more complicated uh, functions like that, then this code would just blow out exponentially and then the complexity to both artist and programmer would be huge. Now, don't forget that all of this is talking about precise solutions where we're exactly representing a surface or an object. Okay. Tron. I don't know why that's there, but I like Tron. Actually, no, I do know why this is here. Okay. Uh, everything in Tron is represented exactly. Everything here is ray trace, which is a uh, method where you actually fire virtual photons or little bits of light at every single object, and then you get it to bounce back off little mathematical models, and then you end up creating a scene like this, all with math mathematical constructs. And so, Tron is one of the um, very first uh, computer graphics oriented movies. And these light cycles here, as you can see, you've got all of these different uh, types of objects. Like you've got this sphere looking thing, you've got these curves, and you've got 
this massive plane, which is the ground. And all of these, these things combine together uh, to create a three-dimensional model within the computer. And so what we're talking about at the moment is basically how to represent things like this in the computer. Okay, Tron uses something called constructive solid geometry, which is basically where you do Boolean operations like your AND and your OR um, on logical operators, but you do it on three-dimensional things. And so all of those wheels and everything in, on the vehicles in Tron would be constructed by like adding and subtracting various uh, what are called primitive objects. So here we'd have a sphere, and we'd have some planes and boxes, well actually no planes, boxes and small spheres and these rods. And all of these are combined together in order to construct that object at the top. So once again, this is another uh, way to represent objects precisely. And as you can see here, by combining all of these simpler objects, these composite uh, parts, you can create a more complicated object. Uh, some modern game engines, like the uh, UT engine, I'm not sure about the most recent one, Unreal 3, but a lot of uh, games use this sort of thing to construct very basic level geometry, and they can be combined together to create uh, buildings and all that sort of thing. So, for example, you'd have a massive uh, rectangle or a rectangular prism, I'm not sure what they call it, cubes perhaps. You'd have a cube, and then you can have a smaller cube, and then that can be used to cut out the door of your building. Okay, so all of those are precise solutions which are rarely used in things like computer games because basically computer games tend to want to be fast and they tend to want to represent quite abstract ideas and uh, almost photorealistic things in some instances. And so representing everything like that with uh, complicated uh, formula and everything and functions tends to be quite taxing on the computer and quite taxing on artists and the turnaround time for making these games tends to get quite difficult, especially uh, with that sort of graphics. So what we're talking about here is abstract, uh, sorry, approximate solutions, uh, which is where you take things like the composite objects we saw before, but even simpler, and then combine those to make more complicated uh, geometry inside your uh, 3D representation. So these approximate solutions are more general, meaning that you can apply them. Did you have a question? No, scratch. <laughs> okay. Uh, these approximate solutions are more general in that you can apply these very simple primitive objects, which uh, in most instances are even just a triangle. Uh, and then you can create more complicated meshes and geometry out of them. Uh, it's also easy to do on the GPU. You'll find that pretty much every single GPU is made to work with uh, triangles or quads which are two or three, three point objects. Um, and OpenGL uses this technique, so it's quite relevant to this talk. Uh, you can represent basically anything. Um, I'm sure you could find something that you couldn't, but basically anything you can think of, anything you can see, you can represent with triangles. You just have to have enough of them so that you can't actually tell it's triangles and it looks smooth. Um, the number of polygons or the number of triangles you'll need for an object uh, scales basically linearly with the um, complexity of the object. So if something like this lanyard, lanyard you could probably represent with two triangles or one quad, just that bit. And then something like me, you'd probably talk like maybe 20,000 polygons. And it's in that sort of instance where you'd want something like a uh, third party application to actually make these things, because hard coding, 20,000 polygons, you don't want to do it. Um, yeah, so basically it scales linearly with the complexity, whereas with the, uh, with the parametric solutions, the formula we are talking about before, uh, those are pretty much exponential. And so going from something like a sphere to a rectangle, you're starting to look at branching, a bunch of other sort of operations that you just don't want to be doing on the GPU. Uh, the problem, perhaps, with uh, these simpler solutions, the, using approximate solutions, is that uh, it's basically imprecise. And so you have to choose a level of detail or a number of polygons that go into your models uh, that isn't basically going to cripple the look and the feel or maybe the, data, the rep representation of the data you're using. Uh, not everyone wants to use OpenGL for games. You may be doing scientific visu visualizations or you may be, for example, mapping out a um, MRI of your body. And then if you're going to do that, then you probably want quite a precise solution and then you're talking 
about this increase of computer or GPU usage. Okay, so the first thing we're talking about here is piecewise linearization, uh, which is basically you want to represent something in two dimensions and you want to represent, say, this curve just with lines. And so to represent this curve precisely with lines, you probably couldn't do it because you'd need an infinite number of lines because it's a continuous smooth uh, curve. So what we're going to do is just chuck a pole with points on there that roughly represent uh, where you should turn in order to minimize the number of points. There are ver various functions for this. Um, if you're into calculus, uh, you can look at the curve and the rate of change of the curve and then you can do various heuristics in order to determine where you should turn. But basically, you can simplify this massive curve into this simple uh, linear representation. And so each one of these lines while there's only like 10 lines there, I'm not sure, I could probably count them, someone can tell me if they really want to. But say there's 10 lines there, each one of those is like one multiplication and addition, it's a really simple formula. Whereas previously, if you're using this parametric curve that was there previously, uh, you're looking at really complicated formula and representations. Okay, so we get rid of the previous one and we represent it with this approximate solution. Okay, you can do the same sort of thing um, in three dimensions. And so what we've got here is a continuous surface. We've got this sphere uh, to the left. We've got a uh, tube thing. And then we've got a cube. And so the same sort of idea would be to basically turn each one of these things into triangular um, composites. That is in adding all the triangles together and then you create these larger objects. This is the sort of thing that OpenGL uses. And so this sphere could be represented in OpenGL. Whereas previously what we had before this one couldn't, although I kind of cheated and that H actually is made of triangles, it's just like the billion of them. So you can't actually tell. All right, so this is called triangulation, which is basically where you turn a continuous, exactly represented object into an object that's solely made up of triangles. And throughout all of your usage of OpenGL, you're basically going to be doing this to everything you're using. Okay. Now on the left, this isn't actually technically correct, but uh, that's the sort of thing you're talking about where you've got all these base triangles that make up the object. And so as you can see with the uh, cube there, even though it looks like these are rectangular, you're actually making them up with triangles. And then the same goes for the cylinder there. You've got points of triangles around the outside of the top and then pairs of triangles around the outside. And so when using OpenGL, if you're hard coding everything, you basically got to think in your head how would you construct an object using triangles? I mean, how would you make up something just using all these constituent parts? Okay, so not everyone wants their spheres and their cylinders and all that sort of stuff. You may want something more complicated. Uh, for example, this model, which I stole from uh, Unreal 3, I think. Uh, actually, no, from Gears of War, perhaps. Okay. But as you can see here, um, you've got this object that you've got on the left. And then on the right, you've got the triangles that make it up. And if I can read, that's something like 5,000 triangles to make up that object on the right. And as you can see, where geometry is more complicated or where your parametric functions would be infinitely harder to produce uh, around the face, for example, uh, where you've got lots of detail and that sort of thing, then you have a lot uh, denser mesh. You have a lot more triangles. Okay. And basically, when it's fully rendered, that's the sort of thing you'd be looking at. Now, as you can see here, there's a lot more than just triangles there. It's got a lot of um, texture on top of it. It's got colors, it's got lighting, it's got a lot of other things. A lot of that I won't actually be covering today, but they're advanced topics. And things like shaders um, give you a lot more uh, realistic look than what you might otherwise see. OK, so you're probably all interested what any of this has to do with OpenGL. Um, basically, these are the core concepts that you need to understand in order to be able to use OpenGL efficiently and well. So I'm going to try and now translate all of these ideas across to OpenGL. Okay. Alright, uh, the first thing is basically OpenGL primitives. Uh, as I was saying before, these triangles and these spheres and these squares and all of these different parts are what we call primitive objects. And from these, OpenGL has several primitive objects. Uh, 
the first probably most simple primitive object, which I'm not even sure is hardware accelerated, is a uh, point, which is basically just a coordinate in two or three dimensional space. It's a very simple idea, and it's represented just with one of those vertices that we were talking about before, which is a vector, essentially. So you've got one vector pointing to somewhere in three dimensional space. Let's call this supermaths again. And if you want to uh, render this in OpenGL, you have a GL begin, you tell it you want what you want to do, say I want to make a point, and then you can just list off your points. And in this instance, we've just got one vector, and then as you can see there, the coordinates are one, three, and zero, which means that we go across one, up three, and then in zero. Okay, and then what will that, that will do is just produce a point like that on your screen. Okay, the next slightly more complex primitive is uh, GL line, and it's the same idea. Uh, you've got a vector, just like you did in your point, although this time you want two points, so you can draw a line between them. And so you've got your one three zero, and you've also got a three one zero, and so that now puts two points on your screen. And then what OpenGL will do when you call GL end is it'll draw a line between. Uh, in case you're not really familiar with OpenGL um, to this extent, um, it's to, but to the most basic um, point, OpenGL is basically C. And so you'd all be using Objective C. C is kind of like a step lower. And so all of these functions are C functions, um, which is pretty portable, which means you can use it on any platform pretty much. Anything uses C nowadays. Uh, so GL begin, GL lines. GL vertex, GL vertex, GL end, these are all functions. Uh, what the GL begin and the GL end do is they tell OpenGL, I want to start drawing something. And then the GL end says, I want to stop drawing something. Uh, OpenGL is a heavily state based system, which means that internally what G OpenGL will do is it will say, ah, I'm rendering something now. And then when you start putting vertices in, it'll start sending those vertices to your GPU to be set, uh, drawn. Okay, and so the next primitive we're going to talk about is the triangle. So we've got our previous two vertices, and then we add another one. It's pretty straightforward, um, except this time instead of geo lines, we have geo triangles. And then those three vertices are now the vertices or the vectors that make up the coordinates or the corners of our triangle. And so geo land, and now we've drawn our first triangle. Whoops. Okay, now we've uh, draw our first triangle in 3D. Okay. Excellent. All right. So what this triangle will basically do is it'll be a triangle that can be manipulated in three-dimensional space on your graphics card. And so if you can imagine back to that model of that monster before, each one of those triangles would be made with similar calls to this. This isn't actually the most efficient way to do that, and if you want a more efficient way to do it, you can go to my next talk, which is at three, I think. And so basically, all of these triangles can be drawn, and then you can start to model and rotate and uh, basically build up a three-dimensional object uh, in your GPU. Okay, the next idea is quads, GL quads, um, which is basically four points, a rectangular sort of object. Uh, these, while useful, useful in a lot of instances, um, they tend to not have many uses with more organic shapes. Um, things like the boxes that I had before, I could have actually made up with quads instead of using two triangles paired together. Um, but yeah, quads are quite useful sometimes. It also makes it more efficient to render them. So instead of having to have six points, uh, you can just have four. Although there are other methods of doing that more efficiently. Okay, so yeah, we've got another vector, and then when combined, they create a quad. Now, these quads don't necessarily have to be square. They don't have to have right angle quarters. Um, they're fairly flexible, although you may find some problems if, for example, this corner point was up a bit more and it was convex shape rather than concave. The other way. Okay, <laughs> open geo matrices. Um, all right. This is a slightly more complicated um, topic. 
I'm not going to expect you to understand matrices as a university level topic, although I think some people do it at school as well. But um, basically what a matrix is, it's four columns of vectors. So those vectors we were thinking of before, there's just four of them. Or you could even think of it as, in OpenGL terms at any rate, uh, you can think of it as 16 numbers. Now, you might think, why do I want these 16 numbers? Well, um, there's quite a lot of super maths behind it, but basically you can use these 16 numbers to manipulate objects in three dimensions and do a lot of really complicated operations to these um, vectors and other objects. And you can basically use these 16 numbers to store a whole heap of operations that you're doing. So you, all that moving and rotating and uh, scaling that we're doing before, all of that can be represented with this. In fact, all of that can be represented with just a 3 by 3 matrix. And then that fourth one, we'll see why we're using that later. Okay, so for now, we're just going to think of this 4 by 4 matrix as M. Uh, if you're used to algebra, or which you probably are being computer programs, just a variable, uh, just think of M as a class or a specific object which has all these certain properties where it can apply something to a vector or to an object. Okay, so transformations with matrices. Okay, this is uh, getting towards the more complicated stuff in OpenGL. Uh, how OpenGL works is it stores these matrices or in fact a stack of matrices, which is basically operations on objects. And so all of these things we did previously where we do transformations, translations, um, rotation, scaling, and perspective when you've got a camera. All of these are stored within the matrices themselves. Okay, so the most simple matrix you could probably think of is an identity matrix. And what the identity matrix does is pretty much nothing. So when you add an identity matrix to another matrix, you end up getting the original matrix back. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I explained, but basically matrices have the same sort of properties as numbers or vectors. So you can add them together, you can multiply them, and you can do other operations on them. And the identity matrix is the equivalent of multiplying by one. And so when you multiply any number by one, you just get the same number back again. The same goes for the identity matrix. And in OpenGL, you get this matrix by going GL load identity, which just says the, I, the matrix I want to work with at the moment is the identity matrix. Okay, the next thing, translation, which is moving an object around. Um, that's the sort of matrix you'd be looking at. Although, thankfully, you never actually have to use this matrix directly. You can just use GL-translate. Now, we've got two functions here, which is basically a precision thing. And so, GL-translate D and GL-translate F, the D and the F just refer to double and floating point precision. And so the x, y, and z components in each one of these would be double uh, floats or just floats. Okay, so the next thing is rotation. The rotation matrix is actually quite complicated um, and it gets quite huge. And there's, um, so I couldn't actually fit the proper one on this slide, but this is uh, just an example of a rotation matrix. Uh, these co cos and sine, uh, cosine and uh, sine, which are trigonometric functions, basically for rotation with scalars, sort of. That's supermaths once again. <laughs> okay, so we've got our matrix here, uh, which is the top left uh, part of this matrix has got these trigonometric functions. And what this will basically do is rotate theta degrees, I think that's theta, I don't really know Greek, um, around the z-axis. And so if you can remember before we had our x and our y components, and then we had another one which was z, then this is just rotating and then keeping the z component the same, which we call rotating around the z-axis. Okay, and so we, once again we've got these simple open gel functions, which is gel rotate d and gel rotate f. Once again, the d and the f refer to double and floating point precision. The theta, once again, is the angle that we're going around. So zero means it's not changing. 360 means it's not changing and say 180 means it's flipped 180, or all the way around, upside down. Now the x, y, and z here might be confusing to some people. Um, what it's basically doing is it's specifying 
that vector that you're rotating around. Uh, so a lot of the time you may want to just have three of these functions in a row and just rotate around x, y, and z because it's quite difficult to conceptualize in your head um, the exact vector you want to rotate around to do arbitrary rotations. Okay. And so, as I was saying before with the matrices, if you had three of these together, you had the x, then the y, then the z, then it would combine all of these different operations into one matrix, and then you don't need to do excess computations. You can just use that one matrix and apply it to different vectors to apply those three rotations to all the different vectors. Okay, and now one of the more simple ones is scale, which is just ijk, and it means that you can scale on x, on y, and then on z. So you can, instead of uniformly scaling and just making something bigger, you actually have a bit more control and you can uh, scale on different axes. Axes. Yep. Okay, so uh, once again we've got simple uh, open gel functions, scale D and scale F, double floating point, we see that a lot. Um, and basically each component will then allow you to scale on each component of the vector. Okay, so as I was uh, briefly mentioning, uh, matrices can be combined in OpenGL, and so calling all of these matrix functions in a row um, actually has an effect on the internal state of OpenGL. And so the matrix that you've loaded, your GL load identity, that will slowly get changed from that simple does nothing matrix into one that does all of the operations you apply. Okay, so Using our simple representation for a matrix, which is just T, which is in fact those 16 numbers, um, we can now geo-translate something. And so, as you saw, geo-translate will move the stuff. Now, if we were to apply another operation to that, like scale, then you'll see not only does it scale it, but it scales it around the center. And so, it, it's actually applying both of these operations to the one identity matrix. And then as you do a third operation, and then you combine them all, uh, you're not only uh, translating, scaling, but you're also rotating. Okay, and so you can use all of these different operations uh, to move objects in three-dimensional space. So whilst it's good to hard code your sphere, if you want to actually move that sphere around, uh, you're gonna have to use operations like this. Okay, or I guess you could hard code all your different spheres or just like make them all manually, have some variables for each one of those x, y, and z components, and create some complex maths. Um, but as I was saying, um, you can combine all of these different operations together. Now, it may be that you've got a hierarchy of objects. And so, for example, I'm one separate object, and then my arm is kind of like a child object of me. It's connected to me, and when I move, my arm moves, but my arm can also independently move. Just like here, we've got uh, Earth and we've got the Moon going around the Earth. The Earth and the Moon tend to stay roughly in the same vicinity, you hope, and the Moon tends to go around the Earth. And so what we can do is we combine these operations, and so we'd have a matrix which represents the position and rotation of the Earth, and then we'd have another matrix which represents the Moon, and then by combining those, we can have the Moon moving around the Earth. Now how we do this in OpenGL, is we'd create everything up to the Earth, and then we'd go push matrix. Now what this push matrix would allow us to do is then do more operations and then put, uh, pop them off. So as I was saying before, we've got a stack of matrices. And so as we make all these changes to the identity matrix, and then we get the Earth, then the Earth and the Moon will both um, be together. And they'll probably be exactly on the same point. You won't even see the Moon. And so then we push the matrix, we move the moon out to the side and we start spinning it around. And then what that'll allow us to do is move them independently. Now if we were to leave this here without popping the matrix off, then we'd end up with this absolutely infinite stack and we'd probably run out of stack space pretty quickly. But uh, then by popping that off, then you actually remove that matrix that you had for the moon and you go back to what the Earth was and then you can add other little satellites and other things orbiting around um, basically, it allows you to create a hierarchy of objects, myself, my arm, my fingers, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of these com 
concepts are quite complicated unless you understand the mathematics behind it. It's quite hard to get. So what I'd recommend you do with a lot of these is write them down, think about them, and play around. Just experiment and um, play around with them. Uh, Xcode in its documentation has quite a lot of OpenGL examples. So if you <coughs> actually search for OpenGL, then you'll see all of these concepts and you'll see all of these things that I'm uh, talking to you about at the moment. And uh, hopefully now you'll uh, actually recognize them and know basically what they're doing. And then by playing around with them, you actually see how they interact with each other because there's infinite number of combinations and I couldn't possibly cover them all at the moment. All right, wait a second. I'm not quite sure what I'm waiting for. Right, that's it, the fourth component. Uh, as I was saying before, we could represent all of this with a three by three matrix. Uh, all the translations, scales, uh, rotations, all of this can be represented by just the E1 to E33. Um, so what's this fourth component for? Now, as I briefly said before, um, this fourth one, this fourth component can be used to represent depth or perspective, and it's used in OpenGL for basically what you can think of as the camera. And so what we're talking about is a projection matrix, which is uh, a special type of matrix. Um, what this projection matrix allows you to do is basically make things get smaller as they get further away. You can do other things, like you can have orthographic projections and you can have various other projections. But basically, for most people, it's basically making something smaller as it gets further away. Um, and so there's a special matrix called the projection matrix in OpenGL, which basically converts objects from their little um, planet and orbit and all these matrices we're working with into what we call screen space, uh, which hopefully I've got some slides to talk about. OK. Um, yeah, so basically we can divide uh, this distant, uh, this vector in uh, semi-screen space um, into screen space by basically dividing by the depth. And so this is once again supermass, but um, basically the further away it is, you just divide it and it gets smaller. And so you can always think of it as normalizing in that your x, y, and z are then divided by z. It could be 1 on z, it depends on the implementation. Okay, so now the projection matrix. Um, what the projection matrix basically is, uh, as you can see here, you're just getting a point in three-dimensional space, and then you've got another point, which is the camera, and then you're drawing a line between the two, and then where that line intersects with a plane, that's where you want it on your screen. So if you can just imagine with your eye, for example, uh, light reflects off your iris and goes to the back of your eye, and then it's a similar sort of concept in that you're actually projecting a three-dimensional scene onto a uh, two-dimensional surface. And so, in its most basic form, that's how OpenGL is representing three-dimensional objects in two dimensions and how it's converting from 3D into 2D. Um, yes, and it's automatically uh, multiplied by the model view matrix. The model view matrix is the one we are talking about before with the planets, and the projection matrix is the one that's roughly uh, approximated by this camera here. And so that's a projection, and the model view is the sphere or the planet. And to change between these different matrix modes, and so our geo load identity and our uh, translate scale rotate, to get each of these to work on each individual matrix, we'd call geo uh, matrix mode with projection or model view. And so what this basically does is it moves OpenGL's internal state between these two different things. And it allows you to uh, work on two different matrices and then retain one while you work on another one. It's like the pushing on the stack, except you basically want to be able to work with both of them simultaneously. Oh, and each one of them actually has its own stack. And so you can do push and pop and all of that sort of stuff uh, on each one of these matrices individually. Okay, uh, and all of this is uh, basically set up by OpenGL uh, using GL Frustral. And what this basically does, it allows you to create this matrix using very simple uh, ideas and concepts. So as we can see here, we've got 
our X and our Y components, which is the uh, red and the green, which is basically, if you can think of the screen, you've got the horizontal part of the screen, you've got the vertical part of the screen. And then we've, what we've got here is we've got the blue component, which is basically how far away you are from the camera. Now, how OpenGL works is with a depth buffer, which is uh, slightly more complicated than I'm going to get into, but basically OpenGL can only render things between two depths. And that can be advantageous a lot of the time, but basically it's for a precision and uh, it's in order to make representation and computation faster and a lot of other different things, which gets quite complicated. But basically what this negative Z and this positive Z do is they represent the closest and the furthest uh, distance from the camera that you're able to render. Now, while I've got negative and positive, it's not necessarily the same number, negative and positive. You could have the camera starting in the middle and then going out to the right. That could be zero and then one. Uh, likewise, with the negative and positive Z, quite often you'd only want maybe one for the negative and you'd want maybe 100 or 200 uh, for the positive. This just allows you to construct this projection matrix and then uh, not have to think about it. If you're actually to construct this using each of those 16 numbers, then you probably get quite a headache and you probably find it quite difficult to manipulate it because the mathematics behind it is a lot worse than that rotation matrix that I was talking about and kind of brushed away. Okay, so OpenGL textures. Uh, what is a texture? If you can remember back to that monster, that final picture we saw of it where it actually looked pretty cool and it looked real and it wasn't just triangles or grey. Um, what a texture is, it's basically a image like you'd have in Photoshop and all that sort of thing, except you're kind of wrapping it around an object. And so each one of our triangles can basically what we call have what we call a mapping from two-dimensional to three-dimensional space, or two-dimensional space to the triangle space. And so in this instance, we've got our triangle here, and then we're just basically grabbing a stamp of this texture, this image, and then we're putting that on top of our triangle. And so if you can imagine, if we did that with a whole heap of triangles, we did that with our entire model, then we'd basically have, instead of this flat, kind of boring model, we'd have this three-dimensional textured uh, model that's starting to look good. And then later on we can do things like shaders and all that sort of stuff, and then make it look awesome. Okay, so a texture is basically the ability to turn something that's often 2D, it can be 3D as well, into something three-dimensional and basically add detail where it isn't. Uh, a lot of the time a texture will um, be adding colour, but it can also add things like surface detail or it can appear to add surface detail where there isn't. And then a lot of the time if you like cheating, you can actually do lighting effects with the textures as well. Okay, so generating a texture. Uh, once again, we're using uh, OpenGL's internal state. <coughs> so what we have to do is we have to ask OpenGL for a new texture, or in this case, many new textures. And so what we're basically doing is we're saying to OpenGL, ask my graphics card for some memory, and then I want this memory set up, well, or ready to use as a texture. And so what you do is call this GL gen texture, give it the number of textures you want, which is basically just going to be a number which represents that texture in memory. And then textures is just a pointer to that array that you want to store them into. And so if this is successful, then it'll return an array of numbers, probably linear, as in 1, 2, 3, 4, and then each one of these will represent a texture in memory which you can then use later on. Okay, the way to use it is to bind it, which is geo bind texture. Uh, the GL Texture 2D part basically just says I'm working with a two-dimensional texture. You can work with other dimensions as well, but most of the time you will be wanting to work with a two-dimensional vector. And then Texture 0 is just that first number. So if our first texture was 1, then Texture 1 would just say to OpenGL, I want to work it with the first texture now. And so while previously we were saying uh, push matrix, pop matrix, or uh, Geo matrix mode, geo projection. Uh, all of that is saying I want to work with the projection matrix or I want to work with the ma uh, model view matrix. This is saying I want to work with the first texture. Okay. 
So once you've bound the texture, oh, I should probably change that title. Oh, well. uh, once you've bound the texture, you actually want to create the texture. So where it says binding the current texture at the top, it should say creating the current texture. And so once your texture is bound, you can create it with a function like this. There are all these different parameters. Um, the meaning of the parameters uh, often is platform specific because it depends on the internal representation of your actual uh, data within the, uh, of the image. And so what this is basically doing is getting um, components of your uh, image. If you can imagine your image is a two-dimensional array, um, just not like on your screen, and you've got these points that make up this array. Um, each point is a color, and then each color is made up of red, green, and blue. It can possibly make, be made up of alpha as well. Uh, alpha is transparency. And so you can have potentially four components making up each image. Uh, the target is basically um, what type of texture again? Uh, the level is the bit, uh, mitmap level, I think. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, the mitmap level, and so uh, it's a bit more complicated than I want to uh, get into here, but basically as the textures get further away, you get certain um, artifacts on the texture unless they're scaled properly. And so as something gets further away, you don't quite know which, uh, which colour you want to represent because you've got this image that's huge now trying to be small. And so if you use Photoshop and all that sort of stuff, and when you resize something, it says bilinear or trilinear or something like that interpolation, then basically what the level does is it allows you to specify what you want your image to look like at each size. Um, there are functions that can do this for you, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the internal format um, is basically what you want OpenGL to represent it internally. This is just so that you don't lose precision or uh, if you want to lose precision and all that sort of thing. Uh, the width and the height is the size of the image uh, in pixels. The border, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think that might actually be if you've got a, uh, if your pixels are packed, um, say with four components and you want to skip the fourth component. But I'm not entirely sure, I'm sorry, but you can look that up in the, uh, if you can read this down here, or you can have a look at my slides later, every single slide basically so far has had documentation at the bottom. And uh, once again, you've got the format, which is the format you're giving it in, the type, for example, unsigned characters. So each component of each uh, color may be a byte, which is from zero to 255, Zero being black, 255 being uh, full uh, brightness of that pixel or that component. And then, of course, pixels down the bottom is basically a massive array of all of these components. You don't actually have to specify pixels. You can have that as null if you want, although you'll then have to put the texture information in there some other way. All right, so all of you are probably wondering, how do I use this all with Cocoa? your Apple developers and you actually want to be able to use all of this stuff. Okay, so uh, what we've got is the NS OpenGL context, which in essence is all you really need to use in order to use OpenGL, although there's a lot of helper functions that allow you to get around this um, and make things easy. Basically the OpenGL context is that internal state that I was talking about before. OpenGL stores things like all those matrices and all that stuff internally. The context is basically just saying, this is what I'm currently working with. Other applications can have different contexts. This is my context. This is the OpenGL state that I'm talking about. And so it has things like textures and buffers and all this sort of stuff. And basically to use OpenGL, you want to go in Xcode and you want to add the OpenGL framework to your project. And this will allow you to use OpenGL and use all the stuff and we'll all link and you'll have all the headers and you can use everything. Okay, now if you don't want to be hardcore and code everything yourself, you can use the NS OpenGL view. Uh, the NS OpenGL view uh, basically is just like an NS view. In fact, it's a subclass of NS view, but it manages that NS OpenGL context for you. And so instead of having to do all these low level operations to get your context ready to draw, and um, to flip your buffers around and do all this other stuff that is quite technical and a lot of the time you don't actually have to know to, in order to use OpenGL. You can use the NS OpenGL view which does a lot of it for you. And the Apple engineers have worked 
uh, labored on this and they've made it quite efficient and so as efficient as most other cocoa stuff is, you can use uh, that and it manages the NS OpenGL context. There are some other uh, ways to actually interface with OpenGL instead of the NS OpenGL context, which are actually a lot faster because with object-oriented things, unlike the C API that OpenGL uses, um, there's a lot of overhead calling and all that sort of thing. And if you want to know about that, you can go to my talk later. So as I was saying, it's a subclass of NSView, which means that you can have the same sort of properties. We can get the bounds of it, you can get the size, you can uh, get response when it's resized, and you can do all the sort of stuff that you could do previously, respond to messages, um, except it also allows it to manage the context and it allows you to draw things like that teapot there, which is quite famous, if you know. Um, okay. Yeah, and it also uh, allows you to easily get to a lot of the OpenGL specific settings and set them up for yourself. And so, as I was saying before, you've got RGBA, as in you've got red, green, blue, and you've also got alpha. You may not necessarily want that alpha channel, so in the um, interface builder, you can actually set up whether you have all these different things. You can set up depth buffers, you can set up auxiliary buffers, you can set up a myriad of other things. Um, it just depends on how complex and how much control you want over it. But a lot of the time, just setting it up with the basic settings without changing anything will work, and for a lot of uses, it's quite good. Uh, as you become more, more familiar with OpenGL concepts, you can actually start to manipulate these settings, and you can get performance outcomes from changing the settings, as well as do a lot of fancy effects and uh, do resampling and a lot of other cool things. OK, so you're probably asking, how do I actually use NS OpenGL view? Uh, a lot of the time, you just want to subclass it which basically means there's a few methods you want to override. There's more methods you could override than what I've listed here. Uh, it's an NS view, and so there's millions of uh, methods. Uh, but these are probably the chief ones that you want to look at. Okay, so prepare OpenGL view is the first of those three. Um, what it basically does is once OpenGL is ready to go, it'll call this method, and it's like a wait from nib uh, when you're using Interface Builder. Um, which basically says, when I'm ready to go, let me do OpenGL stuff. And so as I was saying, as uh, the NS OpenGL view manages the uh, OpenGL context, you want to actually make sure that context is set up before you start doing OpenGL stuff. Otherwise, it's not entirely certain what you'll be changing the state of. And so once prepare OpenGL is called, you can actually start to do OpenGL functions. And so what this function here, GeoClearColor, does uh, is it basically says, when I haven't drawn anything, I want the screen to be black. And then this last one in the end is the alpha channel, which basically means fully opaque. And so what you'll uh, do here is you'll just basically say to OpenGL, whenever I clear the screen, make it black. This is also set up in the um, NS OpenGL view. There's actually a part where you can specify the clear color. But it's good to be able to do it manually. Okay, I don't expect you to be able to read that, although if you can, well done. Um, reshape is another one of these functions, and it's basically called whenever the rectangle changes shape or whenever the visible region of the uh, view changes. And so, uh, basically, you want to be able to use this to change all of your camera, so move your camera around or change the aspect ratio of your camera, and basically manipulate all of these OpenGL matrices when your view changes. And so, a lot of the time, uh, if you move your window and you haven't uh, overridden this method, then your teapot or whatever you're representing will just get all squished in instead of changing uniformly. And so, uh, this basically allows you to set up your camera and manipulate your camera as your window changes. And also work with different resolutions. Uh, say, if you had a game and you wanted to change resolution on your screen, then um, this would allow you to basically make everything still work well when it was resized. Okay, uh, actually, I think I've got a bigger version of this. I do, excellent. Okay, what we've got at the top, the main current context, is basically the only interaction we need to do besides, no, actually, yeah, uh, with the OpenGL context. And what it basically does is it says, I want to work with the context of myself. So if you had multiple contexts or you wanted to 
work with a couple of different OpenGL states simultaneously, you could use this to work with them. And so what that basically does is it's the same sort of thing that the super method would be using. It just says use the current context. Then you've got other methods like GL viewport uh, basically uh, sets the, well, sort of, it sets the clipping uh, region or the extents of your um, view. And so what this basically says is I want my view to be the same dimensions as the actual NS view that it's subclass by. And then the aspect ratio um, is basically the aspect ratio of the screen and then we've got all these other functions which then allow us to set up the model matrix, uh, sorry, the projection matrix. And so geo matrix mode that we saw before says work with the projection matrix and then mode identity, all of these things we've seen before, just working out this matrix. Um, and then the frustrum is another function that works on this matrix and basically, as I said before, it creates that camera. And so what this camera is doing is saying, I want my screen to be the aspect ratio of the other screen. And so we've got our X and our Y that we had previously, and then we're saying go from one to 100, which means that I want to see anything that's between one unit away from me and 100 units away from me. And then that basically allows us to create depth. Um, then we've got geo matrix mode, uh, model view, because you basically want to be working within the model view most of the time. And then load identity just sets the model view to nothing. And then geo translate negative three will basically move everything three away from you. And so that'll basically put everything in front of the camera. And then anything that we draw from now on, you'll be able to see. Has anyone got the time? I turned my phone off. It's 12? Right. I'll go faster. Okay, uh, draw rect, uh, basically what you see previously. Uh, draw rect, you set up the current context, you clear it, uh, you've got your glut via teapot, which is basically an external function using glut, which is utility library, which is quite useful, allows you to draw a teapot. Okay, um, well, I promised that I'd talk about comparisons of core graphics, so I'll just do it quickly. Core graphics runs on OpenGL, so basically anything you can do in core graphics you can do in OpenGL if you're hardcore enough. Uh, core graphics basically works with sprites, and so you've got your rectangles that you'd have previously. Uh, these rectangles can be moved around, they can be manipulated, but more complicated things like shapes like me and all that monster that we saw previously, you can't actually do. Um, you can use textures like you would previously, you can use NS images with uh, core graphics, you can use a lot of these things that you'd actually like and uh, it basically makes things easier to use core graphics. Although if you want to do more complicated things like these models, uh, or these three dimensional representations, a lot of the time you want to use OpenGL instead of core graphics. Uh, these are the sort of things that you'd want to use for each technology. Uh, OpenGL down the left, um, core graphics down the right. Um, texture geometry, 3D geometry, complex geometry, need, need for speed. Uh, large data sets, all of these sort of things are OpenGL where performance matters or complex geometry is involved. Uh, core graphics is more for like representing documents, core cover flow, all these sort of special effects which are basically application based. Okay, excellent. Any questions?